Welcome and aloha. I am Mark Schwab, the host of FinTech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. Today we're going across the sea to Europe and then across Europe to Zurich, Switzerland to meet with Urs Lustenberger. Urs is a very experienced and well-traveled Swiss lawyer whose law practice includes Asia Pacific and international clients and issues. Most of us view Switzerland from far away. We, we don't go there, we don't get there. And it seems to be surrounded, but I know it has international relationships and connections. I've asked Urs to share his personal and professional views of life, law practice, and the world from Switzerland. Welcome, Urs, it's good to see you. How are you? Thank you, Mark. Thank you for all the good words and the introduction. It's, it's lovely to be on this show with you. Um, and of course, Switzerland being small makes it being international, because if we just deal with our local issues, we can go home very early in the day. And, well, and I guess, yeah. That, that, that's what I want to ask you about. First of all, I mean, let's, I want to put up a couple images of uh, Switzerland, uh, a couple maps. The first shows Switzerland seems to be landlocked right in the middle of Europe. And we are surrounded by but, the green. Well, there are, there are two things. We are to the south, kind of protected by the Alps, even though we have an Italian part that is south of the Alps. Um, the country as such is kind of cut off by the Alps in the south. We have contacts to the major countries around us, which is the German speaking part to the north, Germany and Austria, the French speaking part to the west, which is France, and the Italian speaking part to the south. And just being nestled into the center of Europe makes us be interdependent with these countries. I think if we, if we would not deal, let's say, with the region of southern Germany, we would not exist. If we would not deal with the region of northern Italy, which is extremely busy uh, economic commercial area, we would not exist. And if we would not uh, interact with the French area around Geneva, we would not exist. So I think, I think these are very crucial contact points for Switzerland. That's very interesting. So what you're telling me is that you have, you have relationships. Is, is that what it's like with these other countries? So you, you don't feel intimidated or surrounded, but you have collegial re relationships. Is that accurate? I think that's very accurate. If you look, <clears throat> for example, at the migration patterns, um, if somebody from Germany migrates to Switzerland, he could blend in very, very easily, speaking generally the same language, even though not the same dialect, but, but speaking the same language. Um, same is true uh, for the French side there. I think from, from a language point of view, they would blend in even easier because the dialect difference is not as big. Same again with Italy. Uh, so there's a lot of daily um, travelers that come just for a job in Switzerland from the French side, from the German side, from the Italian side, and keep the economies in the respective towns uh, buzzing. And without them, it, there would be an incredible slowdown. So we're talking about a, a, a kind of a personal relationships uh, uh, between people of different countries, but it, it, it is enhancing Switzerland's development. And, and how about, I mean, and, and commerce too? I mean, it, it, it helps business? Is that what you're telling me? Not, not, just, yeah. not just people to people, but business to oh. business? Initially, actually, my comments were more about commerce, but then, of course, people to people. Um, it's a tradition in Switzerland to send the young men abroad to learn about how the world functions. So often 
when they go abroad, they find their wives. Uh, so my mother, just to give you an example, my mother comes from Northern Italy. Uh, uh, I myself, I picked my wives from further away, but, but I also found them uh, whilst I was away because it, it's almost traditional that you go abroad you do a stint of work for one year, two years, somewhere in a far, far away country. Then you come home, uh, start your family, and then you know about the world. Well, does that have anything to do with uh, Switzerland's location, with that, that tradition of sending people out? Is that, is that where I that would, comes from? I would think so. It started... Uh, that you would send the people within the country into an into another language region. You know, for example, that the German speakers, they go to the French speaking part and vice versa, uh, because it just opens your horizon if you learn how to firstly communicate in a different language and you see a different culture. Uh, and then as as the world started to become more global, also for Switzerland, uh, uh, instead of just going to the French uh, part of Switzerland, uh, young men and women usually go further abroad. And, and for me, it happened to be America. Uh, for others, it might be even further away. It could be uh, Australia, it could be Germany, uh, whatever, but, but a lot of the young people do a year abroad just to broaden their mind. So that that sounds like a philosophical position in Switzerland that I view as being part of the geographical location that that came out of it, and that travel is good for the country and it's good for the person. And and I know that. You have a lot of relationships with with Asia, and and that expands out in Asia too. Is is that the Switzerland people? They just keep moving out. No, it's absolutely correct. I think when you grow up in Switzerland, just just imagine, <clears throat> you grow up in Switzerland, you're kind of this unruly teenager or whatever. Switzerland is not fun to grow up with because it's very conservative, very quiet, nothing happens, uh, nothing changes. If you think in your head revolution, you can forget about it. It will never happen in Switzerland. So uh, as, a, as a teen and tween, you often dream of going somewhere else where at least something is happening and 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 you know you think of the big towns of the world uh, the megalopolises uh, that could be paris berlin london uh, new york or or now maybe shanghai or all the places that you can think of but you you cannot imagine that you will be spending the rest of your life in this quiet, uh, peaceful surrounding that will never change. And when you then venture abroad, you usually find out that the grass is not so much greener across the fence uh, and you do your own little experiences and you find that it's not so bad to go back to a peaceful country where everything is predictable and all of a sudden you start to like where you come from. And, and this process, I think, is, is uh, or a lot of people go through this process. And, and it, it's part of Swissness to be very critical about the country when you're young and to be very, very grateful about it when you get older. And all of it has to do with travel and meeting other countries, meeting other people from other countries, and, and going out and seeing different. Uh, cultures i guess absolutely absolutely it's uh it's crucial that you see the world and in its various ways and it's in, in its various reflections and that you experience it yourself because if you just read about it or you hear about it that's not the same you have to experience it yourself that's a great philosophy. I mean, that's a great way, in my view, 
for people to learn about other people and actually to make friends and make relationships, not just business, but learn about other cultures. I, I really, I, I didn't know that was a, a, a Swiss philosophy or a, a Swiss way of thinking. That's really great. I really like that. Yeah. And, you know, one of the great things or one of the negative things, you can see it whichever way you want to. Switzerland was never a colonial power. We were never deeply entrenched with, with a foreign nation. So there are no fixed ties, but there's also no fixed enmities. So when we venture out into the world, we are always a minority. We always have to watch. We always have to be a little bit careful. And uh, it makes us good observers, but it makes us also uh, be accepted in wherever country we end up. So we will usually not encounter enmities from old colonial serfs. We will not uh, encounter, you know, whatever. And But it also means that a typical Swiss doesn't have a deeply um, uh, rooted nationalism or pride about the greatness of this fantastic kingdom or whatever it might be we are not we are just a, we are just an amalgamation in the center of 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 europe of various uh, ethnicities and uh, uh, we have to live with that to a certain extent and we have to find our peace in comparison to these other, let's call them fantastic nations, royals and whatever, who claim they are better than whoever. Uh, and we have to find our way into this world and see that maybe we're doing quite the right thing the way we are doing it. But you have to yeah. learn as you grow older. Ah, okay, good. And and in that regard, I mean, is there any uh, special relationships that uh, Switzerland has with any other countries uh, around the world, Asia or United States or Europe? Is there any, or is it more equal? Is it is it just well spread out? Well, it's it's very difficult to answer this question. I, I believe we have the strongest relationships always to our most important trading partners. Uh, so global trade plays a very important role. Right now, our strongest trading partner is the USA, which means they have a lot of sway over how things will work in Switzerland. Um, Germany as such has uh, an enormous uh, economic importance for Switzerland, but Germany is culturally very close to Switzerland, so I would not say there is an enormous political influence. Uh, but but currently the US, I think, yields quite a big stick vis-a-vis -vis Switzerland. Uh, you know, I've also heard that Switzerland is a neutral country. It, what does that mean from the Swiss point of view? Right? Is that true? Is, is, that, is that a correct assumption that I have? Well, Switzerland used to be very neutral. You know, in the, in the medieval ages, Switzerland used to loan out mercenaries to all sorts of kings and kingdoms around us. So uh, it happened that uh, Switzerland loaned enormous amounts of mercenaries to the Pope, uh, where they still are active now, but they also loaned out to the King of France or the King of Lombardia, etc. And then at some point, uh, when all these forces around Switzerland were fighting wars, you had Swiss on both sides, you know, fighting in the in the first line. Uh, of these of these fights, and at, there was one very devastating uh, battle where on both sides enormous amounts of Swiss mercenaries died, and after that 
Switzerland decided to withdraw to, to more or less the current borders. Switzerland at that time had also expansionary uh, goals. All of Northern Italy was once part of Switzerland, a part of, uh, of uh, Eastern France was part of Switzerland. And at that point, Switzerland gave up all these, all these fought over uh, areas withdrew to the current uh, uh, borders and declared itself neutral. And initially that meant we really did not take part in any battles whatsoever. We did not take part, we did not take sides in any of these European, mostly European uh, clashes. And um, I think this neutrality was fine until I remember there was a boycott in South Africa. Uh, South Africa was being boycotted for being uh, for the apartheid regime. And at that time, Switzerland developed its neutrality into uh, taking advantage of it. We, we became a trading hub for trade with South Africa. And that was not really liked by the by the uh, international community. And then it started to slowly redefine its neutrality. Then neutrality became uh, not taking any uh, commercial advantage, not interfering and not taking part in any bloc. And and so, and then it further developed. And the latest development now is we join all the sanctions that the Europeans do, which is not really neutral. Uh, and uh, we take part in condemning uh, Ukraine. Uh, no, sorry, in condemning R Russia. We even start to think about sending uh, weapons to Ukraine. So neutrality has developed into something that is now very difficult to define if you use the word neutrality. I see. So you so there has been a reaction to the to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which I, I, I was not aware that uh, Switzerland had taken that position. And that is not a not not really a neutral yeah. type of position. And so. The, and, and is that is that feeling about it held by the populace by the Swiss people? They feel that way too. That this is wrong. This should stop. I think there is a lot of discussion about it, and um, I think for many people it would be much easier if we would be neutral, really neutral. Uh, but we are deeply embedded in Europe, and so if Europe sanctions something or somebody and we do not and they can flee to our country because of because of that exception uh, we simply will not fit into Europe so the, there is a very clear explanation to the way this neutrality is working out right now and there there are very good explanations for it, but nevertheless, it would be much easier for us if we could remain neutral. Uh, is there any way for Switzerland to be an intermediary to uh, to help bring peace? Is is that a possibility? Has it ever been talked about? Or yeah, it has been talked about, but I think right now it's impossible. Uh, you know, we we. In Switzerland, we loudly speak about uh, collecting all the money of the oligarchs that is within the Swiss banks and use it to rebuild Ukraine. Ah. It, it's not being done yet, but there is talk about that. Mm. And you cannot be taken serious as a, as a mediator if you start to entertain thoughts like that. So. Typically, in the old style neutrality or or where Europe is not so uh, deeply involved, yes, we would be the the typical intermediary, and we have been intermediaries, for example, with Iran, uh, with Iraq. In in those wars, we were still very very neutral, and we could we could be a credible intermediary. Right now, in this war, 
Russia would never accept it and 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 we would be we are tainted so to speak uh, okay all right um I've learned a lot just from you just from those points that you brought up I want to ask you a few few personal questions you you live in Zurich and like to flash a few photos of, of Zurich is that a nice place to live is it a is it enjoyable yeah. what, what what's it like for you know to is it a place for tourists it's a lovely place. Uh, one of the great things is our largest city, Zurich, has maybe a population of four hundred thousand, which is more or less a village in a in a in a big uh, country. Uh, but we do we we call ourselves or we call Zurich the little big city, uh, which means we do quite a bit of business. We have a number of multinationals. Uh, that are important in the world, but nevertheless, it's very easy to get out into nature, to swim in the lake, you know, the, the lake that is in Zurich, we swim in there every day when the weather is warm enough. Uh, we can go to the mountains and have access to relatively un unspoiled nature very, very easily. That makes it very agreeable to live there. And you, you travel around a lot around the world. Uh, any particular countries that uh, you go to, or is it multiple countries, or just where you're asked to, to work, or how does that work? Well, I have business interests, personal business interests in Germany, so I spend a lot of time in Germany. But that for most people, or for most Swiss, that would not be something worth mentioning because a lot of Swiss have some business interests in Germany. <laughs> uh, other than that, uh, the typical orientation of a Swiss and also of me would be towards the South. You know, you go to warmer countries like Italy or southern France, and these are absolutely wonderful places. But when I sit into a plane, uh, it often is Asia, as you know. And right. currently, I just spent two months more or less in, in China. I went to Bhutan, to the Himalayas, to uh, Nepal. Um, and I must say, I'm I'm very fascinated by Asia and whatever country it might be uh, there are, it's just interesting to see the speed of development in these countries you know in Switzerland um, if you if you go through my hometown you can still see the house where I was born uh, it's all still there the schools that I went to etc cetera, etc cetera. if you go to China to the hometown of my wife you will not recognize anything <laughs> everything is is different and uh, and so that has pluses and minuses you know, it can be seen as a huge advantage that you still see your roots, but it also means that when you're young, you're kind of bored. <laughs> it never changes. Let me let me ask you. You you talked about climate a little bit. I want to ask about uh, how the, you have the Swiss Alps, which everybody, you know, loves to to view and think about. Is, is there such a thing as climate change in Switzerland? Is is that does it affect the Swiss Alps? What's happening in that regard? Yeah, it well, there are two things where where there is effect that you could feel. Uh, one is in tourism, you know, for the ski resorts. The ski resorts are not so high up. Uh, so it's not so easy to always have the snow everywhere that you would like to have it for a picturesque scene. Uh, luckily, we have uh, artificial snowing um, machines. I call them snowing machines, where you where you take water out of a pond uh, at sub-zero temperatures and you just let it snow onto the slope so you can ski. But this means that often slopes that, that used to be full of normal snow when I was young, they look like highways on the mountain uh, at certain times because they were just plastered with artificial snow. So that is one way uh, we sometimes feel uh, uh, climate change affects us. And then the more important, more dangerous way is uh, we have 
in the Alps areas that, that are covered by permafrost, permanent frost, where the rocks and the, the crystalline uh, formations that we have, they are kind of glued together by frozen water. And if that starts to melt, you know, we have landslides of an enormous uh, um, extent that could even threaten uh, public uh, roads and so on and so forth. So we have landslides, we have retraction of the glaciers. Um, so so I, I, I hear you saying there is warm. I mean, it's getting warmer. It's getting warmer. It's clearly getting warmer. And you, you know, we, we measure all the movements of the glacier every year. They retract. You can, you can tell, you know, there are sticks on the ground where it was I don't know, last year, and it moves not just in millimeters, it, it moves in meters and more. You know, uh, I've learned already a lot um, about Switzerland through our conversation today. What is there? Is there something about Switzerland that you'd like the people to know? What is there something about living in Switzerland or the country of Switzerland that you'd like to you'd like to tell people about? Well. It's well. First of all, I have to. I I should as a as a good patriot. I should only say good things. So, <laughs> come and see Switzerland. It's a beautiful country. I think most of the foreigners that set foot into Switzerland will love it. Uh, if the weather is a little bit sunny, which is not always the case, uh, but uh, most of most of the visitors. Uh, who do a quick stint through Switzerland will be amazed at at what can be done. Uh, and I would want to leave it with that. We have, you know, we have challenges like every other country. We have challenges to motivate the young people. We have challenges to keep the prosperity the way we would like to see it. You know, on the surface, Switzerland is very prosperous. But still, there there is a growing amount of people who have to work two jobs to make ends meet. Uh, we we have that problem with the middle class that is getting poorer, even though it it the middle class carries all the burden, and paying taxes and so on and so forth. So we have all these issues. I think that. Um, that we see in the Western world happening, we have them as well. We might have them at a slightly less intimidating scale, which is part of what makes Swiss people happy, because if they compare, let's say, to the average German uh, citizen, we can say we are doing better, but it's still you know, there's a certain level of decline and, and these challenges we will have to face like everyone else. Yeah, okay, all right. I I, I appreciate that that insight also. Now, we, we're, we've gone through our time limit. Urs, I wanna thank you, but are there any Swiss words of wisdom that you'd like to leave with us at this time in the world where things are things are difficult all the way around? Okay, I would love the world to become peaceful again and think, and I would like humanity to think in terms of preserving life on the planet. Uh, and I think the first item of preserving life on the planet would be to live in peace. Uh, and the second thing would be to try to preserve what we have. But these are very wise words. It's not so easy to get there. Yeah, I, I appreciate that very much. Uh, Urs Lustenberger, thank you very much for being my guest today. I appreciate your company, your views, and learning about Switzerland. Aloha. Aloha, Mark. It was really a pleasure to talk to you today.